this week on the Back Table Podcast. The variability of most compounding pharmacies, if you're not freeze drying it, you as a patient or you as a provider don't know at what point it was made. And perhaps the patient is now receiving that medication 14 days after it's been made and in a freezer. Well, that product is now degraded a percentage over time because it's been made and now frozen. And so perhaps if you did a trial in the office or maybe you changed pharmacies, you may notice that there is a difference in the efficacy or let's say impact of that drug product based on when it was made versus when the patient received it. Whereas with freeze drying, it's 100% efficacy at the time in which it's mixed because that water's been removed. And so with freeze drying, our current priapism rate is less than 0.001% of the total dispensed vials of product that we've made over the last six years. Once they receive the product, they don't have to use it right away. They can keep it on the shelf until they're ready to use it and then mix it. And of course, once they mix it, use it, put it immediately into the refrigerator to maintain proper temperature so you get the full longevity of the product. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Backtable Urology Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. RevivirX, providing urology-specific sterile and non-sterile combining services to the specialties of urology and fertility since 2016. They currently work with over 500 urologists in 36 states, servicing over 200,000 patients live. They pride themselves on service quality, and innovation. Products like their ICI injections are lyophilized to provide temperature stability to allow for shipping, easy of travel, and fewer incidences of priapism compared to premixed formulations. Products Revive RX produces include HCG, FSH, Trimix, Trimix Gel, Libido Enhancement for Men and Women, Hormone Replacement, and over 80 unique urology-specific compounds. All pharmaceuticals produced in our facility follow federal guidelines for sourcing, compounding, and dispensing. Find them online at revivarx.com. That's R-E-V-I-V-E-R-X.com or call 888-689-2271. Orders may be faxed to 888-689-162. 20 or sent electronically to Revive RX Houston. Now back to the show. With Jose Ocha Silva as your host this week. Today we have a special episode. We have uh, Dr. Jordan Grant, a urologist as well as Aaron Schneider, a pharmacist. Jordan attended a Texas Tech for Medicine, then he did residency at Texas AM, College of Medicine, School White and Medical Center. He currently is a urologist in Paris, Texas, and Aaron has a degree in pharmacy and is the co-founder and director of operation of Revive RX Pharmacy. Gentlemen, welcome to Backtable. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. So today we're going to be talking about compounding and its uses in urology. Let's start with, with the definition. So Aaron, when we're talking about compounding, what are we saying? Well, what does it mean? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's a little bit of a loaded question because it really means a lot of things today. The practice of compounding really in terms of how it applies to urology specifically is as a practice, it creates unique patient treatment options that fit a specific patient's need or removes a barrier that the current commercially available product might have for a patient. This may mean removing the allergen or the in ingredient that may cause that allergy reaction, changing a preservative perhaps, or changing the route of the administration of that product perhaps changing it from uh, an injectable to a topical application, removing a dye or ingredient, removing a problematic preservative. Compounding in urology is important because many compounded pharmaceutical treatments developed for urology provide a greater benefit to the patient than the commercially available product. As an example, Edix, which is one of the more well-known products that has a comparable compounded formulation, Edix is the active ingredient is a prostadil. Prostadil is not as effective for most patients as a compounded ICI injection might be. 
Uh, ICI injections can be unique to that patient's need. ICI injections, also known as trimix or bimix injections that are common compounded terms for those types of injections. Compounding, in that case, enhances the treatment by the addition of additional vasodilatory mechanisms. And in some formulation, that addition of, let's say, papaverin helps with smooth muscle relaxation and can provide a more effective treatment than the commercially available product. Uh, the list of opportunities for compounding in urology, as well as other specialty areas, really goes on and on. So, are in your pharmacy, I mean, do you do a lot of ED or more testosterone and, and hypogodalism related issues? It's a mix. We, we do a lot of both. Our primary focus since 2016 has been the focus of urology. We recognized early on that there was a specific need to urology and that a lot of the treatment options aren't covered by insurance. Many of them require unique formulations that are specific to those patients' need. And so we do a lot of testosterone. We, we do a lot of fertility and maintenance of fertility drug products. We do a lot of erectile dysfunction as well. Really anything that complements urology, we've touched on it at some point if the application is necessary or perhaps there's a back order of need with a commercially available product. And Jordan, how about in your practice? Do you use compounding for, for all these issues? Yeah, we've, I use it all the time, actually. I write, I write for compounded prescriptions daily. I've been out of training almost seven years, I guess, out of residency. And when we were in residency, I didn't get any exposure to compounded medications. You, know, you kind of hear about it, but it was kind of some stigma associated at that time. And then when I got out in the quote-unquote real world, I worked in Shreveport, Louisiana for two years, and the docs there were using compounded left and right. And man, it was great. I get to start exploring options for alternative options for especially like testosterone creams that the guys didn't want to do injectables. There were some local compounders there in Shreveport and started doing that. Cialis wasn't generic yet, so they were doing the troches and those kind of things. I mean, that was a, a game changer for those guys, especially, you know, like Aaron was saying, the intracavernosal injections, bimix, trimix, quad mix. I mean, that's a lifesaver to have that as an affordable option for these guys who you know, I remember being a residency at the VA part-time and, you know, they'd give them four EDEX. That was it. That's all you got was four. I think, you know, they come in the prepackaged dose. So that's what you get. So it's really nice to have that option. Now I prescribe Trimix all the time. I prescribe testosterone from Revive all the time. Actually, they've got a great compounded testosterone in grapeseed oil, which is a lot smoother. I have patients that have had weird reactions to the commercial oils, either the oils or some kind of preservative in there. We'll switch them over to Revive grapeseed and a lot of their like little acne and just weird things their habit will clear up. So yeah, I use compounding all the time. Patients love it. And Jordan, how do you start? I mean, because most patients think that their insurance will cover everything. And then after three, four months of going back and forth, they end up doing the compounding anyway. And for me, I use compounding, but I, I will say that I don't maximize it or don't go straight into it just because of the patient they think that the insurance is going to cover everything. How do you talk to the patient? It's very difficult. I, I have that conversation every day. I have to warn them, okay, you want your insurance to cover this, number one. They may not do it because your levels are quote-unquote normal for what they need, which I don't base things off the normal range for the most part. Number two, the most local pharmacies now are requiring patients get the small one milliliter vials instead of the 10. They hate that. And I just warn them, listen, if you're going to go through insurance, you're going to end up getting these one cc vials. It's going to be annoying, especially if you're dosing multiple times a week. And so they learn fairly quickly. Now, some guys like in where we are in Paris, a lot of the local pharmacies still will give the 10 cc vials if you kind of more smaller pharmacies and stuff. In the bigger cities, if I see guys, it won't happen. So a lot of my guys in bigger cities, we go straight compounding. That's a, that's a great point. There's, there's a couple of areas or a couple of factors that you pointed out regarding um, specific formulations in terms of testosterone using a, a grapeseed formula versus a commercially available option. I think there's a misconception around whether or not there's a true allergy to grapeseed oil or in fact, it could be the preservative. We've actually seen just as a comparison, you know, grapeseed oil has less of a viscosity than cottonseed or sesame oil that would be in the depot testosterone you would find at a Walgreens or a CVS or a Walmart versus a compounded formula that has a grapeseed. But in terms of unique products, as well as in terms of 
compliance and really focused on building good quality products here at Revive. Uh, one of the things that we've identified is that more often the allergy associated with the injectable testosterone is not the oil, but it is a preservative. And so that's another unique aspect of compounding where we can also pivot a patient to, let's say, testosterone enanthate that uses a different preservative than one that is compatible with testosterone cypionate. And more often than not, we see that allergy-related reaction go away when we do that transition from cypionate to enanthate because of the preservative change. There's a lot of unique opportunities to serve that patient with compounded products. And Aaron, you mentioned the intracarbosinol injection. For patients that, that they travel a lot, are there products out there that don't need to be refrigerated? That's an excellent question. We do a unique form of compounding that includes freeze drying or lyophilization. That process removes the moisture or water from that product once it's filtered and sterilized and dispensed into a vial. It goes through the process of sublimation. And in that unique program that we've designed with the freeze dryer that we use in our clean room, by removing that moisture, stabilizes that product. So it can ship in various temperature changes without impacting the efficacy of the product. And so not only does it help from a cost standpoint, we can produce more vials and keep them ready to ship on the shelf versus your traditional format for a pharmacy making pre-mixed formulations that require the product to be frozen or refrigerated. The moment that product is mixed, you have a timeline that generally starts where that product begins to break down. You start to see a significant breakdown in that product once it's mixed around 30 days refrigerated. If you freeze it, you can sometimes extend it to 60 days, but the uniqueness to our product being freeze-dried, the patient would receive a kit to mix it, but in terms of freeze drying it, we can ship it USPS. You can buy multiple vials. You can travel with it without worrying about the temperature change or, or shipping it on ice. Easy for someone to take in a carry on and get to their destination and mix it. Once it's mixed, we recommend refrigeration, but it's allowed us to help provide a better customer consumer experience by being able to ready ship a product and then not have to worry about coordinating the pickup of the product once, let's say, FedEx or USPS delivers it. It can sit in a mailbox, no issue, at above 150 degrees without impacting the product. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that process is really that stability factor has resulted in far fewer issues of priapism because the variability of most compounding pharmacies, if you're not freeze drying it, you as a patient or you as a provider don't know at what point it was made. And perhaps the patient is now receiving that medication 14 days after it's been made and in a freezer. Well, that product is now degraded a percentage over time because it's been made and now frozen. And so perhaps if you did a trial in the office or maybe you changed pharmacies, you may notice that there is a difference in the efficacy or let's say impact of that drug product based on when it was made versus when the patient received it. Whereas with freeze drying, it's 100% efficacy at the time in which it's mixed because that water's been removed within minutes or it's gone into a, a holding pattern where it, over time that water's been removed within a matter of hours and it doesn't impact the quality of that product. So it's, it's in a dry powder format. The patient receives it with a bacteriostatic water vial, mixing instructions and then dosing instructions. And so our current priapism rate is less than 0.001% of the total dispensed vials of product that we've made over the last six years. That's awesome. And do you guys also give the antidote just in case? We have offered to make it, but we have never had to dispense it. The few cases that ended up in priapism that were significant, it was because the patient didn't follow our instructions, but we can offer that if necessary. I think today we have a total of about five cases over the last six years of priapism that resulted in some type of emergency room visit, urgent care visit, or a late phone call to one of our pharmacists. So Jordan, so you do the prescription and then the pharmacy, Aaron, or the, the, the compounding pharmacy takes care of everything else? That's right. Yeah. I prescribe, like I said, for Trimix or HCG, FSH, testosterone, whatever. 
it's so easy on my end. I just send the prescription and I tell the patient, you know, I always write this down for them, write the phone number of the pharmacy, say Revive is going to be reaching out to you to get your payment and shipping information and go from there. And um, for my Trimix guys, usually they'll bring it into the clinic and I'll show them how to mix it, kind of do the test dose, you know, things like that. But yeah, it's so simple. I use products from Revive personally. We have a team of pharmacists on staff that can help answer questions regarding reconstitution and dosing. We provide a, a dosing document that they can follow that provides explicit instructions on how to inject. A lot of that reduction of priapism is, is really associated with education. And once the patient mixes it the first time, we often never hear from them. We only hear from them if there's an issue or a question regarding application, change of dose. We will, if the provider allows, discuss titrating that dose as well. So it's meant to try and help that patient achieve the effective dose because we know you know, other factors are at play in achieving, you know, a successful outcome. They may be taking a blood pressure medication they didn't take before the doctor and the, and the patient had an opportunity to discuss therapy in the office to do a trial, perhaps. Or perhaps they've started a pain medication that impacts their ability to achieve an erection. And so titrating the dose may matter. And so we do provide instructions on how to do so if in first case they don't achieve the desired effect. Or in future cases, they want to continue to use a drug product but need a slightly higher dose. And we will guide them at, at the will of the provider who we work with, but we do that often. And Jordan, going back to the parameters, we, we talked that sometimes the insurance, or the, not, not sometimes, every time the insurance wants set the parameters very low that you have to be in the 200s. What parameters do you use to start that patient on testosterone, for example? I'm probably more liberal than most urologists when it comes to this. I've kind of just mainly based on being a patient myself and seeing guys who fit the bill when it comes to the symptoms, even though their numbers may look fine. I also check free testosterone. I know it's not really part of the guidelines or it wasn't at one time, I mean, even though the studies use free testosterone. So I check both, you know, and if I see somebody in, in single digit, you know, I convert everything to nanograms per deciliter and I see them in single digit free T which a lot of these guys are, and they got symptoms, I have no problem treating them. I would kind of talk about doing a trial of TRT. I think that's a reasonable thing to do. And a lot of these guys, if they're honest with themselves, three months in, they don't feel any better. It's like, you're probably not running your natural production three months in. And we, we have ways to, you know, rebound that if we need to. But yeah, that's why I don't like playing the insurance game. It's just such a, I get it if that's all they can do. I, I, I understand it. I do. We, I mean, we still have the old school guys that come in once a week and get an injection in the clinic because that's, that's what they want and the insurance pays for it and they actually feel better. And that's what's important to me is them feeling better. I'd rather them have that than have nothing. But man, the, the insurance game, I hate it. So I just, I love the fact that we can get these compounded medicines. And fertility, again, I, know, I don't know if you were going to touch on that, but that's a big part of what I do is maintenance of fertility. And I don't rip guys off their testosterone if they have zero sperm counts. We'll add HCG. If that doesn't do the trick, we'll add FSH along with it. I've just been amazed with Revive, like how affordable their HCG and FSH are, and they work. I've had at least six or seven guys in the past three years that have had zero sperm counts who are now fathers, and that FSH works really quick. Four to eight weeks, you know, one or two vials, it usually gets the job done. It's pretty awesome. That stuff used to be so expensive. I'm sure it still is, name brand. Exactly. So, so prior to going to HCG, let me ask you, in terms of, of the compounding and the testosterone, are you using the cream? Are you using injections? How, how do you decide what to offer the patient? It's easy usually when you, if they've never been on anything, because a lot of guys I see are coming from other places where they've kind of been mishandled and will try to dial things in. And a lot of times they're already kind of happy with what they're doing. They just want to you know, tweak it. If they're a newbie, the first time I say injections, if they cringe and say, I hate needles, I say, let's try cream. It's just there's nothing wrong with cream. I've done both. And so a lot of guys coming in already have that in their head. They already know what they want to do. And then others, I say, if you hate needles, let's try cream first. It doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody absorbs it great. Or if they just end up hating it. I've got some guys that are like, I just can't remember to do it. I don't get that because it's like brushing your teeth. But hey, you forget, then go back to injections. We teach them how to do shots. So it's really just personal preference or based on maybe a few other things where they just don't feel right. Some guys just don't do well with injections. You know, they still have the brain fog or they have skin outbreaks. Again, you're in injecting preservatives and some people's body just don't like that. And I'm like, well, let's try a, a topical and just see. And a lot of times their skin clears up, their, their brain fog lifts. So I can't explain it, but I, I definitely see it. 
To speak to the compounding aspect there, you know, we make our testosterone injectable with grapeseed oil because of the viscosity, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. But the reason for that is to allow us the option of either dosing IM or sub-Q. Most of our patients today actually use testosterone sub-Q. We today work with over 500 urologists and I think in total about 1,200 physicians across 36 states. And we found that the optimal level is actually the benefit of stabilizing that testosterone level above that minimum threshold is easier to achieve in more frequent doses sub-Q rather than your once weekly dose IM. So splitting that typical IM dose across two injections or three, you see a baseline level that avoids a lot of the crash at the end of their therapy before they dose again and allows the patient to have a better baseline. And it's also easier in terms of an application. We send supplies. And so generally for a sub-Q dose, we send 27 gauge 1cc syringes and patients will take, you know, 30 units to 50 units, depending on the provider's recommendation and prescription, sub-Q three times a week or twice a week. And we found that early, the the need for education is important because it's a little bit difficult of a draw. But once they're adapted to that change in how they draw the medication, it may be slightly longer to draw up a smaller dose just because of the diameter of that needle when you're still drawing an oil, even though it's less viscous than, let's say, the depo testosterone. Once they get used to it, it's such an easier injection. You're not dealing with the soreness, perhaps tissue tear, not knowing how to dose with a 1cc syringe, trying to pick an area to dose. It's just, it's a lot more pleasant. But we do have options, you know, creams and other uh, testosterone options are available. We're, we're about to launch a uh, oral dose as well with testosterone on decanoate. So the, the sub-Q is in the forearm or where do you, where do you inject? My guys, it's wherever they feel doing it. Honestly, a lot of guys use the abdomen and it's kind of 50, 50. Some guys love it and some guys get welts and things. I think it, again, it's person specific. And then obviously water-based stuff is sub Q. So I tell them to, yeah, kind of try the abdomen area, just like they were, if they were doing a water base, there's all kinds of videos. A lot of these guys are pretty savvy. So they're already kind of tuned in with videos on YouTube and it's not that hard, but you know, I did, I've done both as far as personally, I've done IM injections and I've done cream. I haven't, I never did sub Q testosterone, so I can't speak to how it worked on myself, but I got tired of doing injections. So I finally switched to cream. I uh, had some had some issues with a, an injection going wrong one time, and that was enough for me. I've been doing injections for eight years, and so how was the transition? Now, you, now you're the patient. How was the transition? It's fine, actually. I was kind of like you know the creams. A lot of people poo poo the cream and compounded cream. If you absorb it well, it's very potent. And it works really well. You get daily or twice daily application, like your levels are stable. So it's again patient preference and trial and error is the key with with all this stuff. Yeah, with with the compounded creams, you know you can compound a higher concentration of dose, so you get a more effective dose than your standard androgel or testem, where you're you're getting one point I think six two five percent. Whereas with a compounded formulation, you know, we could do up to twenty percent, and uh, and so you're your effective dose is is achievable with a cream versus your standard commercially available products really just don't get the patient to asymptomatic or relief, really. And Jordan, you, you mentioned HCG and FSH. There's been like a shortage. Some compounders are not doing it. Aaron, what do you have to say about that? That's a big question. I don't want to bore people, but I'll give you kind of the hopefully rough and dirty answer. I answer this question a lot. When this became a big buzz in 2020, in March of 2020, uh, I was answering this question almost every day. And now that people have gotten more comfortable with what is the, the status of this product with compounding, it's less frequent, but it's important to explain kind of what happened. So this is information I've gathered through a series of conversations with FDA consultants and ex-FDA policy manager, attorney, pharmacist, and friends and family and industry, members of the FDA, ex-FDA officials. So what was described to me was in 2013, the Obama administration had instructed the FDA to come up with a plan to reduce the cost of insulin and not intentionally to create an impact of reclassifying HCG or any of these fertility medications. And the FDA's position is not 
to impact the economy or the financial means of affording a medication. Their primary role is to protect the public, to make sure that facilities who are producing pharmaceuticals or even supplements are operating in a way that follows good manufacturing practices that make safe and effective products for the public, not to design a path for a way to manipulate the market to reduce the cost of a drug. And from 2013 to 2020, you know, you had seven years. And in that time span, I think we had three FDA commissioners. And so as time rolls on, you see change in control happen. And, you know, in 13, that commissioner knew he was on the way out the door and he didn't care about that initiative. And so it gets rolled over to the next person and then rolls over to who I think at the time was either Gottlieb or whoever came before him who finally put their stamp on the initiative that was instructed by the Obama administration. Well, in that process, they kind of, by way of the information I've gathered, scrambled to put something together to satisfy this request. And they thought of the idea of using the biologics registration that already existed for manufacturing facilities. So they decided that they needed to reclassify insulin as a biologic. At the time, insulin was insulin. It didn't really have a drug category. This is back in 2013. And insulin was insulin. You had insulin-like products and you had insulin. Those are two different categories. Well, in order for them to create a path for insulin to be under the umbrella of a biologics manufacturer that would hold a registration to do so or manufacture with a biologics registration, they reclassified insulin, but they created a way to kind of bridge insulin into that category and essentially defined it as a material that was of animal origin or human origin of a certain peptide chain based on its molecular structure. And that loose classification, whether it was on purpose or an accident, looped in all of these other drugs with a similar qualification. And unfortunately, that included HCG, that included FSH, that included gonadarellin, minotropins, other drug products, and they seemingly, most of them, fell into the fertility category. So I have a hard time believing there wasn't some intent. Uh, maybe it was on purpose, maybe it wasn't, but in any case, it impacted pharmacy compounding and the availability of this drug product. What's interesting about ACG is that at one time it was an over-the-counter holistic therapy. Prior to 13, there was a few years where it actually had made it onto the shelf at retail stores as an oral holistic treatment option. It then got pulled because the FDA reevaluated that and it became a pharmaceutical again sometime before 2013. And then all of a sudden now it's a biologic. Really, the registration of a biologic is one that is to protect the individual that's producing that product, not necessarily the end user. That registration holds true to really more manufacturing purposes. And so anyways, chasing a rabbit trail there, but the ACG product was reclassed as a biologic. And because of that, it created some prohibitions on compounding with that material. The reason that biologics are really prohibited or that classification prohibits certain types of compounding is because they want to protect the people who are manipulating the product. They're not really focused on what happens to the end user. Is once the end user is using it, the expectation is that they're the ones that need it. And so this registration happens. And in 19, the FDA delivers the message that this is going to happen in March of 2020. Well, we got wind of this in 19 when everyone else did, and we hopped on the phone and we started making phone calls. We re reconnected with some FDA compliance consultants, FDA compliance attorneys to figure out what to make of this. What is the FDA's plan for enforcement? What is really their intent with this document? And if you read the full memorandum that they released in 19 and then made it final in 2020, there is a process for compounding with biologics. The FDA defined that in 2018, even before that memorandum was released, which is included in the reference document of mixing, reconstitution, and diluting of biologics for the purpose of compounding. It's a reference document you can pull down from the FDA's website. Well, we followed that document since we started compounding that 
product in 2018. And during that time, we had been sourcing that product from FDA registered manufacturers. It goes through an FDA registered distributor. When ordering it, it goes through customs where an agent of the FDA receives that uh, material, whether it's a contracted or carrier that is a partner with the FDA to review that documentation. Yeah, it's, it's stamped as a pharmaceutical. They know where it's going. They know its final destination. They know who ordered it, if it's appropriately labeled. And so we work with these registered entities to source that product and have been since the beginning. So I'm bouncing around a little bit here, but with the HCG being reclassed, with the memorandum that allows for that biologics compounding, it also includes where there's a need to service the public if there is a back order. We all know that Pregnil, Novarel, and the current generic that's available is, is really not available. And so in 2020, when this came to light, we recognized where we had a significant patient need. We were following all the necessary steps to continue to compound it and compound it pursuant to the FDA's recommendations. We reached out to our partners, our contacts, to gather information to make sure that we were doing it in the best way fit, to make sure the public is safe, that we're operating in a way that conforms to the FDA's reference documents. And we have been through two FDA inspections and We've had no questions. We've produced all of that documentation. And so what's challenging, I think, for a lot of urologists that come to us or have found us by way of knowing that you know, we're still offering that product compounded when we can and the commercial available is not, a, not able to be dispensed, they're confused because they've likely heard from another pharmacy that you know the FDA told them they couldn't or they give them some response that doesn't give context to what that memorandum said, what the FDA's reference guidance says, and the proper way to source and produce a product like ACG. I think that many pharmacies that were making it were probably making it in small volumes, and they realized that product is very expensive. So very likely pharmacies stopped making it in some cases because it was financially related. In some cases, it was very difficult to source and there were limited sources that produce it in reference to the USP reference document for ACG as a material or an active pharmaceutical ingredient. USP is the reference document that manufacturers are supposed to produce product that is safe for, let's say, compounding or pharmaceutical manufacturing. Not very many manufacturers that are overseas follow that reference guidance or reference document to produce it in that way. And so there's a limited number of resources making it difficult to source. So I think people just kind of gave up on it. And the few that I know were making it for a period, I think some of them are, are still. There are still others out there that are producing HCG. But, you know, they, the FDA visits facilities and they do a risk assessment based on what product they're producing. And perhaps can they maintain the FDA's recommendations for how to produce a product or how to provide the supportive documentation for the ingredients they're using to compound with? And if there's questions around whether or not the sources were capable of producing a safe and effective product or perhaps using an unregistered source for a material or just not following the, uh, the process that is defined in that guidance document brings a question. Right. So I can't speak for other facilities, but what I can say is we're doing everything possible to fall in line with what is safe and what is appropriate for the patient and follows the state and federal regulatory guidelines. Sorry for the long winded response there, but there's a lot of history there that I think people don't quite know. And I think to give it at least an understanding of kind of how that whole process started and knowing that at some point HCG was an over the counter. It is not an unsafe product. It's recognized as safe. Given its status as a biologic, it's considered a hazardous material, which is the other area where it made it difficult for compounding pharmacies to produce. If you're going to categorize it as a hazardous material, there are some compounding regulations and requirements that require your facility to be set up to produce it in the first place. And so there are facilities that likely didn't want to make the investment 
for one product to accommodate that reclassification. And so you need a hazardous compounding area, which is a negative pressure room to accommodate that type of material for compounding. And if you don't have that type of environment, and really that environment is designed to protect the individual compounding with the material, if you don't have that type of environment, it then opens you up to state regulatory guidance. I think that's all beyond, I mean, our scope. Thanks for the explanation, and it was great. And Jordan, in terms of the of your decision to start a patient with ACG, you talk about fertility, keeping that fertility. Does the patient give you any setback or because you're doing HCG? I mean, right now, I, th I don't think that the patients know all the dilemma with ACG, right? Well, a lot of mine did. A lot of guys that I inherited the last few years came from other places that were told, you know, a lot of these, I'm not going to knock the telemed places at all, but they're told they have to take HCG with their testosterone. And so a lot of these guys came to me from these other places where they're already on it. And then when a certain big compounder in Texas was unable to compound HCG anymore, which is where most of these guys were getting it because that's where their clinics got it. They, they freaked out. I mean, they, it was a nightmare at first. And I know Revive got like hammered for a bit with the orders for ACG. I mean, it was kind of, but they, they caught up quick. I mean, it may have been a month or something. I told guys, Hey, you know, we just can't get it right now. You know, we had to do just like a vial at a time at first for, for fertility only. Like there were, it wasn't like, yeah, you just want to take it to keep your testicles larger. Like, sorry guys, you got to, you know, we try to really triage it just for fertility purposes. And now, you know, like I said, I'm not a stickler where like, Oh, you have to be on ACG when you're on TRT. I, I, I just don't. Um, there's a lot of guys that don't feel they feel worse when they start ACG and not better. So that's a patient preference thing. And then obviously for fertility, it's kind of a no brainer. Like if you want to try and maintain, we got to do some HCG and, and then they have to know that's not permanent either. It will still be a slow decrease in the sperm count. Usually over time, it's just not as quick. And then that's where FSH comes in. And what do you do for a patient that has low T and wants to do, wants to keep the fertility? What's your protocol? I keep them on their testosterone. And if it's a fertility, if it's like they're really freaking out and there's, we get a semen analysis, obviously. And if it's zero, I kind of get them started on F HCG, FSH right away at the same time. And I do, I, I don't know, go crazy with the HCG. I know there's some protocols, like I know Dr. Lipschultz protocol, he has different ones for his patients. And some of the HCG doses are, are crazy high. And I understand that. I just, I'm trying to limit side effects while still get the job done. So I'll usually do like 500 IUs of HCG three times a week to start. And I do 150 I use FSH three times a week. And you could probably actually get by with 75 of FSH. I think that's what they used to do with HMG was 75, but I just go for 150. It's just sort of one I, I kind of made it up just, and it seems to work so far. So how often do you follow those patients with labs? So when we start somebody on testosterone, let's say if they're on cream, I'll get labs at three or four weeks just to make sure they're not wasting their time on it. Cause I, I don't want them to pay for it if they don't absorb it. Injections, we do it at six weeks and then typically six months after that. And then once I, once they're dialed in, quote unquote, personally, I like just once a year on their testosterone labs, usually they get, they're getting more than that with their PCPs anyway. If they want to check them more frequently, they can. A lot of my guys and kind of what I do is try to talk them off the ledge because they're, they're over anxious about lab work all the time. And, you know, they come in with their spreadsheets and they've got labs every two months and they're, it's just, I used to be that guy, so I understand it, but it, it almost paralyzes you because you're, you're so focused on numbers, you're not as much focused on symptom resolution. And so I'm not as big of a stickler for frequent labs as long as everything else is smooth sailing and they're not having issues. Obviously, if you're dose suggesting or whatever, then labs will come in more handy. Is there a unique compounding formulation that you prescribe in your practice? As far as uh, cream or? Uh, for, for example, well, I mean, if you ask something specific, do you call Aaron, hey, I want this formulation and, and he prepares? How does that work? Not really. I haven't had to go anything that specific. I know that if I needed to, they would, though. Okay. Yeah, I know they, they can do those. And I think they do that. Aaron, you can speak to this more with like, if you're trying to get a special ratio of like thyroid hormone, things like that, you can titrate T3, T4 to different ratios. We have the uh, ability to do custom formulations. We, over the years, since 2016, working in this space, supporting urologists, we have a formulary that we really work off of that probably offers the solutions to, to 90% of urologists. So it's not common that we get corresponding requests for unique formulations, but we can make them. You know, Trimix, we have eight formulations today, and, and that services the greatest, the greater need. We can even do a uh, intraurethral gel 
and really that product is great for someone segueing into an injection because, you know, honestly, the injections are what works. But for a patient who's just really having a, a hard time using a needle for that particular purpose, the injections or the gel can help benefit that patient, uh, at least interim, until we transition to something that's it's really the most effective option for them in the future. But yeah, unique formulations are definitely available. And essentially, they, they call you up and, 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 and discuss what they want, and that's how you get it done? Yeah, so the, the, ordering, the ordering process is simple. So if a physician wants to work with us, you know, they can reach out to us, or we have a, a team of people who can support those physicians through our website, reviverx.com. Contact us through the contact form page. We'll have a team reach out to you and give you some information and some tools to get you all the information to prescribe. Generally, it starts with a fax form that includes 90% of our formulations and really the most pertinent ones to urology. For those who are more tech savvy, we do have a portal where the doctor can log in and order through a portal where we can create a template where they can select the drug products and order that way. Of course, we're also, you know, a standard pharmacy that they can order through their EMR. We're connected through SureScripts. So we're Revive RX. We're the only Revive RX in Houston, Texas. So if you search for us in that database, you can send that prescription order through SureScripts if you're able to send a compound. Some providers will send a like product and then add in the note specific compound. If that does happen, we'll reach back out and send over a fax form to get you set up to make that process easier. Or we will call to confirm the order that you wanted and what specific ingredients you wanted or which formulation that we offer that you wanted. So we have a very intuitive group of people supporting us. We have about 78 employees in total at the pharmacy level, 13 pharmacists. So and Aaron, do, do you guys ship to any state? Oh, uh, yeah, we ship to 36 right now. Uh, and you can find out what states we currently are licensed in and able to ship to on the reviverx.com website. You just scroll down to the bottom of the page and it'll highlight which states we are currently licensed in. And we're working on additional states uh, as we continue to grow and expand, but those are the current ones. And going back to the, that ICI, that you mentioned that that doesn't need to be refrigerated. That's one specific of all your trimates like that? Really, all of our formulations are freeze-dried or lyophilized back into its powder format because that particular formulation has a high degree of volatility when it comes to temperature change. Specifically, uh, a prostadil is not temperature stable. It is really the uh, kind of backbone, if you will, of an ICI injection, the other products helped really build on that in terms of smooth muscle relaxation, blood flow, and achieving the erection or desired effect. And so it's important to provide stability because really temperature change in shipment because we're a mail order pharmacy. We do allow pickups if you're local, Houston, but you know generally we're shipping out most of the medications across the state and into other states. That temperature change, even with an ice pack, is very difficult to manage. Hot months, even colder months, temperature variability, it may sit in a truck longer than you want it to. You may try to ship something next day to New York and it just doesn't get there in time. And unfortunately, most carriers deliver between the hours of 9 and 6 and most people aren't home. And so if it has the need to be refrigerated, it becomes very challenging to make sure that the product is not impacted. And so with breeze drying, you don't have to worry about that. It can ship standard mail. It can take five days. The temperature change in a truck, even in hot months, are not going to impact the quality of the product not going to lead to priapism. Once they receive the product, they don't have to use it right away. They can keep it on the shelf until they're ready to use it and then mix it. And of course, once they mix it, use it, put it immediately in the refrigerator to maintain proper temperature. So you get the full longevity of the product. And Aaron, uh, another question, because that's probably all the patients ask me, do you guys send samples sometimes or, or for some type of, of prescriptions? Yeah, we, we don't do samples really because we're not a 503B or a 503A, which requires a patient-specific prescription, but we can work out something that a patient who has maybe never tried it, we can offer some financial assistance that makes it a very affordable for them to try the medication. Our prices today are typically more affordable than really any solution I've come across, but really depends on the pharmacy that that particular physician has been working with. But if there's any hesitancy to use us because of price or the patient is concerned, 
concern, we can work with that patient to at least establish a dose. We've developed some programs where patients who are new to Trimex formulas, and it's really now the physician recognizes your traditional PDE5s aren't working. We can offer, let's say you try the first one, if it doesn't work, the first vial, if the titratable dose doesn't also work, then we can work with you replacing it with a perhaps higher concentration if necessary. We have situations where people start out on bimix and they determine it gets them 90% of the way there, but it's just not enough. Transitioning them to trimix and offering some assistance by increasing that dose or changing the formulation to be more appropriate. And that would be something we would work with the physician on. So generally it's, let's try it on the patient, let them contact us. If there's an issue, we'll contact the doctor. That way the doctor's not burdened with that conversation. And the reason that I ask, I mean, I haven't find anyone that any compounding pharmacy that does free samples. Just asking because always the, the patient wants that everything for free or the insurance covers it. It's really a compliance thing. Free is a challenging word to work around when it comes to medical devices, medical products, pharmaceuticals, right? You know, the the pharma industry has uh, the ability to do that as a as a pharmacy. We just don't have the the really regulatory guidance or backbone to provide let's say samples, but there are programs that we can offer to make it where if the patient has a financial barrier to trying it, we can work with the patient to, to figure out what makes sense. Yeah, the, the, the patients are always asking for samples of Viagra <laughs> and Cialis. I, I haven't seen those reps for at least five years. No. Yeah. Uh, do you see those reps? Yeah, it's, it's been a long, long time. So, <laughs> Yeah, the, the landscape of what the, the pharmaceutical reps can and cannot do has really changed significantly in the last 10 years, but maybe even more so in the last five. I, I can't really speak to that. Jordan, and at some point, going back to ICG, did you heard that there was a liability uh, by using the compounding pharmacy? No, it never bothered me. I do what's right for the patient uh, in my mind. Like I, I see no issues using compounding. I know there's stigma. I guess the stigma, and I didn't, I didn't keep up with the stigma about the HCG diet. I think that's where a lot of this came from and people poo-pooed that. I'm like, nobody seemed to look into the HCG diet and realize people were eating 500 calories a day and like starving themselves. And that's why they were, you know what I mean? Like they just, oh, HCG. And then who knows what else they were doing, right? So it, it, that was frustrating, but used properly, these things seem to be quite safe. I mean, obviously everything can have an effect that you don't want. HCG is one of them. Guys complain of water retention and other kinds of weird things. It's just that it's, it's going to happen when you're injecting a compound into your body that is like ACG. It just is what it is. It's, you know, it's not LH. It's it's not identical necessarily. So, and it's not made, the, you know, like we make it naturally. So, and same with testosterone. I always tell that to guys. We're giving this artificially, so it's not the same, but we try to get you feeling good. So anyway, it's a sidebar, but no, I have no issues using ACG. I've never, never thought twice about it using compounded. Yeah. What's important just kind of to come off the back of that question is really, if there's a takeaway from this for, for those listeners is, you know, if you're working with a pharmacy, you know, make sure that they're providing you the opportunity to discuss what type of sterility testing are they doing on their products? What type of batch testing? How frequent do they test their products? How frequent do they do endotoxin testing? That's not just sterility. Sterility is just a basis of knowing that it's sterile. Endotoxin testing will tell you that even a sterile product could cause a reaction locally due to potential bacterial contamination that maybe are non-infective. So that's also a step that's important in a sterile produced product. And then potency testing and how frequently they do potency of batches. And in addition to that, you know, certificates of analysis, I think those are really your basis for knowing that that particular pharmacy has some form of quality system in place. So your certificate of analysis is a copy that I would at least ask for as a baseline, which is the quality of the product that they are using, the quality of the active pharmaceutical ingredient they are using in the medication that you are prescribing to your patient. That tells you the high degree of quality, the assay of the chemical. You really want that to, to be at at 95% or higher. Most of our products are at 98 to 99, which is above the FDA's minimum threshold. The additional steps would be, you know, asking for a copy of a sterility test, at least to know that they're doing that type of testing and in a copy of their latest endotoxin testing to ensure that they're going beyond just sterility. And then potency would be 
just an additional to, to say, hey, we, we know that this is going to be effective because they have a good formulation that doesn't lag in potency. Your formulations in, in compounding, really, you have to have a team that's knowledgeable of how to buffer a solution that prevents you from impacting the potency because your formulation is not compatible with the active ingredient, even post-formulation, even if your certificate of analysis shows the product is of high quality, if your formulation doesn't yield the potency that produces the desired effect or potency that represents the dose of that labeled product, you're not going to get the outcome you want. And so it's important to know those things and know the facility you're working with does those types of testing. Can I just say too, like, I've seen this with, and I'm not knocking local compounders at all. Most of them aren't doing injectable, obviously, but let's say with creams, I see a lot of variability in testosterone lab levels in the same patient on some of the local, and this isn't just here. This is guys that are using it all over the place. They'll get a lab test. It's like, there's nothing in there. And I think they did a study on that in Canadian compounding pharmacies with hormonal creams where it was all over the board. And so you want a bigger, in my opinion, I mean, it's, it's nice to have a bigger compounding pharmacy that is batch testing, is doing all this stuff to, to ensure that it's done the right way every single time because you don't want to get a bad batch of your testosterone cream and feel like crap for a month. Uh, you know, I don't. And to, to that point for even non-sterile, the testing requirements are different, but what's important for your non-sterile products like creams and oral dosage forms is, is the source of the material appropriate and is the let's say vehicle, whether it's a cream base or let's say a trochee base or a design trochee base, meaning it's something that would create a substance that allows that product to dissolve under the tongue and do so in a way that is conducive to what the product or material or active material you're using would allow is appropriate. And so you'll get variability across some compounding pharmacies if in fact Maybe they're making their own cream base, and that cream base may not be compatible with that active ingredient, and therefore it doesn't absorb correctly. Or with a trochee base, if it doesn't match the material or active's ability to absorb correctly, it may impact the product to actually achieve the desired effect or dose. It may have nothing to do with the active, but the formulation will matter. No, exactly. And, and you guys, I mean, it is the, every time that I have a guest here, that does men's health, they do compounding and definitely talking about the efficacy, the, the safety. I mean, I think it's something that, that is safer for the patient. It's easier for the practice, I think. At the end of the day, you don't need to be dealing with all the paperwork for the these, uh, insurance are asking, that just trying to delay the patient getting the treatment that they need. So you're doing good for the patient. And there, there are other excellent compounding pharmacies out there. It's I'd love, love to serve any of the listeners with the products that we offer, but make sure that you, you pay attention to, to the processes that they have in place to ensure that the patients you are prescribing medications to are getting safe and effective treatments. Jordan, anything else? That's it, man. I, thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I just, like I said, I'm a simple guy in Texas and I just, I use, I use <laughs> what works. I love compounding because it really is about patient care and these things, especially with Revive, their prices are fantastic. But I mean, in general, compounding is just such a great way to go, especially for hormones. Some of these things just are insanely expensive, you know, if insurance doesn't cover them, but people still want to go whatever, get the name brand. I just, I love it. I really do. It's been a game changer as far as what I've seen in my short time in practice for just how to help these people in so many different ways. And so that's a big deal. Female HRT is a whole other ball game and I don't do females, my wife does, but it's fantastic for them too. It's fantastic. Okay, well, great. And Aaron, so, so you mentioned the website, how do other urologists can go there and request your service? Uh, yeah, they, they would just go to revivrx.com. They'd reach out to us through our contact us page or our provider page, send us an inbound request and we'll have someone contact them shortly. It's really just an information sheet, name, contact. We have a lot of, you know, urology practices or other practices who will have a staff member send us that information. Or they can just pick up the phone and call us. You know, the, the number's right there. And call us, ask to speak to one of the pharmacists or one of the team members. We'll get you set up right away. Lastly, you can always email me. And it's just Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at revivrx.com, and we'll get you set up. I'll point you to the right folks to, to help get you set up as quickly as possible. Thank you, guys. 
Thanks, man. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thanks for being back table. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Devante Delbrun. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.